so today I will be presenting um, a paper called Single Cell DNA Methylation and 3D Genome Architecture in the Human Brain. Um, I have the DOI here. Um, it'll be mostly um, a shorter presentation. There's a, it's a really big paper, and I'll be diving into a couple things that caught my attention and then sort of covering what I didn't cover. But um, there's a lot to this paper, but I will just get started. Um, so there are some key concepts here to like understand what this paper was talking about. So this paper was really focused on um, two things. So like DNA methylation and then what's called chromatin confirmation. Um, both of them are really critical to understanding just like epigenetics as a whole. Um, the, the goal for this manuscript, actually at the bottom, I probably should have put this at the top of the slide, um, was really to like profile these two different types of information. So DNA methylation and chromatin confirmation. Um, critically, this was at single cell resolution and across many different brain regions. So really the goal was to form an like an epigenetic atlas, that's what they called it, um, of the human brain. Um, so a huge number of brain regions. Um, but in terms of the topics that were involved, so um, there's chromatin. So chromatin, it's like the genome itself has a physical arrangement in 3D space. Um, and the way it's sort of shaped controls how um, gene promoters and um, like the interaction between gene promoters and regulatory elements. Also, like um, chromatin can be physically accessible or inaccessible, which uh, affects how genes are expressed. Um, there's also a few different terms of like ways chromatin can be arranged that are um, sort of well-defined or known already. So there's like what are called active versus repressive compartments, um, topologically associated domains, chromatin loops. So a bunch of different features that chromatin can have. Um, in terms of methylation, um, so like very briefly, methylation is like a dynamic chemical modification that occurs at cytosines. So like cytosines can have a, a methyl group attached to them. Um, and a very crude summary is like often when um, a methyl group is attached to a cytosine, it can suppress that gene from being expressed. Um, often that's definitely not a hard rule and it can, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, the reason I call it dynamic is because um, it can um, vary throughout age or depending on the environment. Um, it's definitely known to have a big effect um, in terms of changing throughout age. Um, but yeah, these two things were critical to understanding the rest of the paper. Um, so to get into like the study design, which is also pretty important, um, they had a huge number of brain regions at the resolution they were talking about, which, um, so like this was 46 different regions and adult humans. So um, a lot of different areas, cerebral cortex, is a forebrain, is nuclei, hippocampus, thalamus, midbrain, pons, and cerebellum. Um, they had a small number of donors. Obviously, it wouldn't be possible to have like this extent of, of brain regions with like a huge number of donors. So there, there were three adult males, um, and each of them covered almost all, all the regions. Um, another critical choice that they made was, um, I think this is something that comes up in our study designs as well, is like deciding how much of um, neurons versus non-neurons to select for. Um, so they did 90% new and positive cells and 10% new and negative. So mostly neurons, but then getting some glia and other types of cells. Um, there are a few different assays that they use. So um, the first two were um, like getting DNA methylation and then chromatin confirmation. They also um, mentioned that they use single nucleus RNA-seq and then single nucleus TAC-seq to confirm some of the information that they got from the the methylation and chromatin confirmation from the other assays, um, which were, were the main focus, I think. Um, so just to dive into things that caught my attention, with this um, so figure one was a big, a big one. Uh, I figured in panel A, they just were talking about the, the that should be forty six brain regions, like I mentioned. Um, so profiling a lot of different areas in the brain. Um, panel B was just like a little depiction that they're capturing both DNA and methylation and chromatin confirmation, confirmation information. Um, so both methylation and then like features of chromatin, including loops, compartments, and domains. Um, so figure C is something maybe we're more familiar with where um, they were clustering um, the DNA methylation at single cell resolution. Um, and so this is the lower dimensional representation. In this case, TSNE, we also see a lot of view maps a lot. Are 
our data. Um, but so in this lower dimensional space, you can see that they cluster pretty into distinct um, groups that they have annotated um, as particular cell types. Um, so in C, they actually zoom in a little bit um, going left to right, they're zooming into the smaller area where they um, show particular excitatory and inhibitory subtypes. Um, and then in panel E, they show uh, so markers for inhibitory and excitatory neurons, and that show that they have a, a sort of smooth gradient um, in terms of um, CPH methylation. So that's interesting to see. Um, so panel, I'll just keep going through panels. Uh, panel D, um, so they have all of these cell types that they've annotated. Um, like I said before, it's mostly neurons, but then we have these have some non-neuronal types. Um, and I guess I'll use my cursor. So in here, they have the number of each cell type. So um, they could have a good amount of each for the most part. Um, in the next row in D, they show the uh, how the cell types are distributed throughout the different brain regions. Um, often, I feel like I'm used to the reverse type of plot where you have um, brain regions would be the uh, x-axis and then the fill would be cell type. But in this case, I think they're making a point about um, trying to show information about the individual cell types, not like the composition by brain region necessarily. Um, in any case, they do have like, um, like a lot of these cell types are specific to particular brain regions. Like the example on the very left is just purely um, hippocampus, um, but other cell types have um, sort of a wider range of brain regions that they occur in. Um, and then quickly to go through the other panels, so H um, just shows that like cell types differ in terms of their overall methylation. Um, and so you can see that in the, the lower dimensional representation. Um, and I did something interesting where they sort of profile two different genes um, that are directly re related to sort of the machinery of methylation itself. So like DNM T1 is DNA methylation or DNA methyl transferase one. So it's directly involved in the methylation process itself. And so they were sort of just checking that like these key genes are should be correlated with the methylation rate, um, which they are. So um, it's good to check that. Um, so another thing that caught my attention, another piece of paper that caught my attention um, was sections where they related um, their findings to sort of like diseases or um, different traits, um, which is a lot of what we do here, of course. Um, so to summarize the set of kind of information that they're showing here, they, they use um, LD score regression. So like um, linkage, de the stands for link linkage disequilibrium score regression. So um, linkage disequilibrium as a whole is like non-random association between um, alleles at different loci um, within a population. Um, and in this case, they're relating sort of like the score, so the, the amount of non-randomness, um, which is the LD score, they're relating that to like um, differential methylation signal. Um, and a particular point that they were trying to make, or that they did make in the paper um, in figure 3H, that they pointed out that schizophrenia and bipolar risk variants were like enriched in areas of lower, um, in DMRs, differentially methylated regions with lower methylation. Um, but particularly in some of the excitatory neurons in the cortex and hippocampus. Um, so it's, there's a lot of cell types here, but that, that's sort of like one of the key findings, I guess, from if you look in the schizophrenia and the bipolar disorder rows. Obviously, this whole region sort of clusters. There's other traits, but um, those are two disorders that we um, are interested in. Um, so the difference between figure 3H on the top right and figure the supplementary figure 15 is um, sort of like which DMRs they were looking at. Figure 3H was, I think, all DMRs, to my understanding. And then um, S15 was particularly DMRs that overlapped chromatin loops, um, the way they described it. So um, similar information, different DMRs. And um, um, yeah, so it was cool to see this relationship with some uh, like disease traits. Um, um, another thing that caught my attention was like the way that they tried to summarize um, information about like methylation profiles and across brain regions. Um, 
I thought this was cool because like it was sort of like a they created their own low dimensional representation. Um, I would have to look more into the methods about this because it's cool. But um, in panel A, they show like this lower dimensional space where they particularly design it such that um, so each of these points is a cell, but cells that are closer together are similar in brain in um, methylation profile and also tend to come from the same brain regions. So there are sort of like two things that they were selecting for in terms of what distance were uh, represented. Um, so in panel B, they just show how each of those cell types is distributed in that lower dimensional space. Um, and then something cool that they did was that they have, they do sort of like a, um, they call this like an axis. So this little line on the right, panel A, is, um, to my understanding, it's something sort of like PCA in the sense that we're sort of covering a the um, axis along which a lot of the variation from for each cell is occurring in terms of di uh, differences in methylation profiles and brain region. Um, it's in, if it were PCA, it would be a straight line, right? But um, so this is sort of a different, I guess, nonlinear way of looking at it. Um, and then following up on that. Um, so we have panel B, like I said, but then panel C, to my understanding, it was sort of like flattening that, that axis that they described. And the, I guess it would become more of like the X axis. It was kind of hard for me to understand um, the relationship between B and C, but that was my understanding. Um, and then you sort of discretize it by brain region, which like, like I said, was the X axis. Um, so you can see how each of the cells is like, they have the, um, Average sort of like the average um, along the axis versus how much each cell varied along the axis, which is the standard deviation. And uh, um, basically, they could sh show that like there's a gradient of the way that these cell types are distributed across brain region and methylation profile um, along the axis that they sort of define. Uh, and then panel D, I forgot to mention that like the coloring in panel B um, and also the x axis and C is related to the, the dissection region. Um, so like I said, like the farther what or like the difference, um, the more different the brain regions, the the farther away that they should be in this lower dimensional space, which is, you can see in like the top left in panel B, for example, like it goes smoothly from one sort of across brain regions. Um, so I, I thought this was a really cool way of representing the information that I haven't really seen before. Um, I'm used to like PCA and sort of those types of things. Um, so another piece um, that caught my attention was this um, thing that they did where they um, basically, they it reminded me of like polygenic risk score. Um, so it was something they were doing where they were trying to find a subset of specific methylation sites that um, most effectively predicted cell type. Um, so with like PRS, it would be like genotype, the small set of genotype or SNPs, um, genotypes at certain SNPs that would um, predict a disease or, or something else. Um, but in this case, it's like instead of genotypes, it would be like methylation sites. And then they were trying to predict these cell types that they profiled. So they're trying to find a minimal set that is highly predictive. Um, so they had this workflow where they were trying to design like a, a model to um, a model that would try to use the information of methylation sites to, to predict cell type, and then they were trying to s select features such that, um, like, the the sites that they had were highly predictive. So, and then they called it like a um, SNM code, so like a single nucleus uh, methylation code. Um, so yeah, it just reminded me of like PRS, and that's what caught my attention. Um, Um, that was, I think that's all I, oh, okay. Uh, I also want to talk about like, so this was a big paper and there's a lot of stuff I didn't actually cover here. So I just wanted to mention that um, stuff I didn't go through, um, where they also did like a cross species um, check, in this case, like human and mouse, assessing how um, cell types and like methylation was conserved across human and mouse. Um, a lot of things I didn't cover, there was a lot to the, the um, Chromatin confirmation stuff I didn't cover. Um, so they did like a, a uh, contact distance comparison by cell type, where one big conclusion was that neur neurons had tended to have shorter um, interaction distances. 
Um, and then also showing how different features like compartments topologically associated with domains and loops were um, varied by cell type. And then also to see how um, methylation and chromatin features were correlated. So definitely a lot to this paper and I encourage you to check out the rest of it. Um, Thank you, Nick.